I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Peter Merchant, toxinologist and conservationist. Good day, mate. Hey, Adrian. And you're the man who started Venom Supplies. Yep. Yeah, way back in uh, early '80s, uh, me and I started Venom Supplies with uh, not a lot of money, and uh, we gathered a few snakes and started producing the venom. And thought, what are we going to do with this venom? And uh, I was pursuing CSL a fair bit in those days because they were really probably the only place I knew that would buy it. And I must have worried them enough that they took me on as a producer of venom. And uh, we got our first order, which in those days was a substantial amount of money. It was $13,000 worth of venom. Uh, These days, that's not much, but... um, those days it sort of set us on our feet and we're able to buy a bit of equipment and uh, produce the venom a little bit better. I was uh, taking my venom down to the local university and freeze drying it there and uh, with that money I was able to buy my own equipment and uh, produce our own freeze dried venom at home. So we got the contract and we supplied them with venom and uh, that kept on going year after year and uh, I started to go to some um, uh, toxin conferences around the world just to start to get right into the groove of uh, producing toxins and knowing all about what they do and all all the people that were doing the research. And um, so it was a fascinating field, I must say. I didn't know a lot about it when I started, but I got into it and um, I started to talked to a lot of them and uh, got involved with a lot of them and uh, started to suggest things that we could do and suddenly I found myself involved in toxin research (laughs) and um, yeah we did things on all sorts of things and eventually uh, when uh, we moved to the Brossa Valley uh, we set up Venom Supplies there, I got involved with UniSA and uh, I became an adjunct researcher there at UniSA and um, we did research on a number of things, and one of the things we looked at was digestion, the role of venom in digestion. And um, it was a fairly controversial thing because a lot of research had already researchers had published that uh, venom doesn't have any role in digestion, and I couldn't believe that. And uh, so we did, I think, three projects all together and published them, and. Um, found that uh, the venom was definitely impacting both stomach digestion and uh, intestinal digestion. And we published that work. And um, I think we we proved, at least from our point of view, that uh, venom had a pretty big role in those two areas. But still, uh, there are people out there that don't believe it and uh, they think it doesn't have any role at all. Yeah, you kind of think it would because, like, especially with the necropsy side of things, like, that's rotten stuff to start with. So you yeah. kind of think that is, it's got to be to yeah, do with digestion. Think, I mean, it's logical that it would mm. because snakes can't chew their food up. Uh, they swallow the food as one big lump. Mm. And uh, whilst they do have pretty strong um, digestive fluids in their stomach and their intestines, um, uh, the venom gets right inside the animal and circulates through the body of the animal when the when the animal's bitten, and that starts off the process of uh, digestion. Which do you reckon came first, the ability to use venom to immobilise prey, or the digestive function? Uh, I would have no idea. Actually, <laughs> it certainly uh, has both those roles. I mean, probably the predominant role is to immobilise the prey, uh, the, the snake has to do that because it doesn't have any arms or legs to hold the animal. And um, so it needs a way of quickly immobilising the animal. It's like taipans. When they bite an animal, they do it very quickly. They bite a rat. They go in whack, bite the animal, and the animal runs off. So they don't want it to go too far, otherwise they won't find it. 
So uh, very quickly that animal becomes immobilised and the snake finds it and is able to, to eat it. Um, so, yeah, that's the most important thing, immobilisation. It could have a third role as well, the venom, and that is uh, discouraging people to, or animal, other animals, to, to uh, try and kill it or interfere with the snake. Um, and they have these compounds in the venom such as uh, algesic compounds, not analgesic, but algesic compounds, which cause a lot of pain. And the, if you're ever subjected to that part of the venom, you'll, you'd, you'd think you wouldn't mess with a snake again because it's a pretty nasty experience. So there's probably those three roles, the venom. So there's uh, primarily the immobilisation, but secondarily the uh, digestion and... Uh, and the uh, deterrent effect. So that when you, when it comes to like when they bite their prey and their prey flees, is that why snake venom is some of us think is so much stronger than it really needs to be? Is it so that it knocks something down as quick as possible rather than it can kill twelve adult humans? <laughs> That's probably a good point. Um, it's never it was never ever designed to affect humans at all. Mm. Just that we're very similar to a lot of mammals. So, and because the prey items of a lot of snakes are mammals, uh, it affects us as well. But um, it affects all... If you did experiments on all the different mammals, including humans, which you wouldn't, uh, you'd find that the effects of the venom uh, are different for all those different animals. And one school of thought is, uh, on some, at least with some venoms, the venom has not evolve to affect the prey animals and then another school of thought and there are plenty of scientific publications on those that the venom is primarily has evolved to best affect those animals that it preys on yeah i think um the mangrove snake in asia i think like i, I could be wrong <laughs> i would have to check this i think their venom only affects the prey item that they eat if if they bite us Apparently it has very little to no real effect to us, but it wipes out their prey item, which I think is birds, really quickly. Yeah. So. Look, I'm not sure about that species uh, mm. in particular, but certainly there are other species of snakes around the world that prey on birds, and it affects them very quickly. It drops their blood pressure very rapidly, and, of course, if your blood pressure drops you become unconscious and uh, if that happens to a bird it won't fly away so very important for those species Mm. and it's hard to think that the venom didn't really evolve to uh, affect those prey items Uh, it was rather it just evolved depending on where it was and that's certainly one school of thought Mm. interesting yeah I need maybe one of those snakes because I had ridiculously high blood pressure recently (laughs) Yes, you did. Anyway, it's a whole other story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you raise that subject because uh, some of the blood pressure medications that are taken by people today, uh, a lot of those came from the Brazilian Viper originally. The original compounds, the lead compounds, came from the uh, Brazilian Viper. Wow. A, lot, a lot of the ones that end in prill um, are derived from snake venom. Some of them come from other animals like leeches and other animals that affect your blood too. You may be taking snake venom at the moment. Uh, there you go. There you go. I know, <laughs> I know someone that. who takes something that's a derivative from Gila monster venom. Yes, uh, that's uh, for uh, diabetes, I think. That would be memory. right. Yeah. 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 So when people say the only good snake's a dead snake, you reckon there's a lot of reasons why snakes are all right? Well, um, it's good you say that because that's how I was brought up as a child uh, my father said taught me that only a dead snake's a good snake um, you know as I got older I started to challenge some of the things I was told as a kid and um, I thought it's, it's pretty rough for the snakes to, to have that opinion and um, I thought I'd try and do something nice for the snake and find something good for the venom and there are lots and lots of uses that you can put to venom I mean the obvious one is anti-venom which uh, is used to treat us if we've been by a snake. But uh, there are many other applications of venom, far more than just the antivenom. 
uh, and the one we just mentioned was the, the blood pressure medication, but there are many others, and not just for treatments, but also for uh, diagnostic purposes. And there are many snake venoms that are used for diagnostic purposes, especially in the blood coagulation area. So there's all different types of venoms, and they all have different effects on their prey. So when you come up with, when you, you milk the different snakes to make the different antivenines, how many different types of antivenines are there? In Australia, there are, I think, six, six uh, antivenoms, and they're made for uh, the tiger group, all the tiger snake group, uh, which includes uh, black, uh, black snakes. Some of the black snakes they use tiger snake antivenom for. Uh, the broad-headed snakes um, and tiger snake venom is the first anti-venom of choice to use against a lot of the smaller snakes which we, <coughs> which we don't have any anti-venoms for. Okay, what about copperheads? Are they under the tiger snake? They venom? are, yep. yeah, copperhead uh, snake bites which are pretty rare. Uh, they use tiger snake anti-venom. But uh, then we have death adder anti-venom which is used for all the death adders and the taipan, which is used for the three or four taipans we have. Um, and then there are black snake, the black snake antivenom, which is made from the king brown snake venom, uh, but it's used for the king brown snake and a number of other uh, members of the black snake group. Uh, and then there is, um, what's, what's the other one? <laughs> That's probably another one. There's the polyvalent, uh, isn't the there? The polyvalent, which covers all of them. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, uh, all of snake antivenoms in Australia are actually polyvalent. Okay. Uh, it's just uh, you need a different volume of antivenom for the different types of snake bites. So it's just the way that CSL make their antivenom uh, that they all end up being polyvalent anyway. So it won't hurt you at all if you're bitten by a brown snake and they give you a tiger snake antivenom. Oh. It won't hurt you at all. No. What about sea snakes? Because they've evolved from yeah. some of the land lappers, haven't they, the ones in Australia? Uh, well, I'm not the best person to talk about evolution of snakes. That's a whole subject on its own. But I think it's the other way around. I think uh, the land snakes actually evolved from the sea snakes, but there is a separate sea snake antivenom for sea snake bites, which uh, is made from a snake venom that comes from Malaysia. We don't actually use uh, the sea snakes in Australia. And they were thought to be the same. This was the beak sea snake. The beak sea snake from the northern waters of Australia was thought to be the same as the one from Malaysia, but since there's been some taxonomic changes and uh, it's a different species, but nevertheless the antivenom made for sea snakes from Malaysia, and this is made by CSL here in Australia, um, uh, is the uh, same. It, it, it works quite well for all the sea snakes in Australia and, and also other parts of the world as well. So we've got some of the most toxic snakes in the world here in Australia and you always see the LD50 top 10. But is the LD50 re- representative of what would happen if a human was bitten by some of these snakes? Uh, probably not. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, different animals have a different response, response to the venom and we all said and done, humans are just other animals and so we, we would be affected differently to those laboratory animals that have been tested already. So we don't really know what the LD50 is for humans uh, but nevertheless, if it's got a low LD50 in mice uh, you can pretty safely assume that's going to affect humans fairly Fairly similarly, but so it's the lower, the more serious. It yeah, is, yeah. So um, uh, it's wrong to do these charts and have the top ten snakes or so on. That's in mice, or, or if the, if the test animals were guinea pigs or anything else, it's it's for them. But most of the studies uh, that the LD fifties were done were done with mice, and uh, that's how those those uh, top 10 snakes or whatever number of snakes in any country are produced using those LD50 numbers. So you think they should redesign it and use humans to get the <laughs> some, some people uh, would, would think that's true, yes. 
Now we're sitting in your lounge room here, and yeah. you've got the most incredible view looking out here. Um, there's some beautiful wetlands that lead yeah. into the. Well, you're near the mouth of the Murray here, aren't you? Uh, very close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you'd have a few snakes here. We do. We do. And Mia would be very happy that she liked the view out there because she. She's very happy with her garden. And <laughs> it's got to be one yeah. of the best views. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a number of snakes that live here on this property and uh, we, we like them here because they do control the rat species. We have both native and introduced rats here and uh, they do a good job at controlling the rat species. Uh, we have red bellies, browns, tiger snakes here. Yeah. So what's left? Just the... Pygmy little, copperhead, I guess. Little whip. Oh, uh, we never don't really think pygmy copperheads are here. They're more up in the uh, in the higher mm. areas in the Adelaide Hills, Florio Peninsula. But uh, we've never ever seen one here. Mm. We may have whip snakes, little whip snakes. I've never seen one, but could be here, and uh, even the yellow face whip snake. But I've not seen them. Yeah, I read there was a yellow face whip snakes were seen at. Cox Scrub Conservation Park once upon a time. Yeah. They're one of three extinct reptiles in the Adelaide area. Yeah. Um, them, death adders and pygmy blue tongues, yeah. like locally extinct. So they could be around. Uh, death adders, uh, I don't think so. They were, they used to be found around Adelaide Airport and um, Glenelg in the sand dunes, but all those sand dunes are pretty much uh, changed from what they were originally and not really suitable for death adders anymore. Uh, the, the last one that was caught in Adelaide was at Mawson Lakes, uh, which was in the 80s, I think. Wow. Um, but nothing mm. ever since then. It's just because we've taken over and using the sand dunes for something else. They still say they're up St Kilda area, don't they? But Look, it's they possible they are. But, yeah, it's possible mm. they are, but I uh, haven't seen them. Mm. Yeah. The closest ones to Adelaide now, in any numbers anyway, is Titty Witty Beach over at... Um, uh, near Ardrossan. Mm. Yeah, there's no push to reintroduce the death adder, is there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, Although they have listed the uh, tiger snake uh, in South Australia as now threatened, and certainly that would lead me onto a subject that's very close to me. Uh, tiger snakes, uh, not in all areas, but in a lot of areas, they have declined quite dramatically. You know, they used to, they're called common tiger snakes, but they're not so common anymore and um, even in areas where they're still reasonably common they're not in the numbers they used to be and certainly around here they're rare mm. now because um, all the things that we've done to the river I mean you, everyone would be well aware of the the amount of water that flows down the river now and it doesn't come in a regular way it doesn't come to suit the tiger snakes or any other species we've got here it uh, it really comes when Regulators feel that they've got too much water upstream, so they let it down. And that might not suit too many of our native species at all. But uh, from the very raw and rough figures that I've done, I think the tiger snakes here have probably declined because of the southern bell frog. Uh, it's another project that we're, we're involved in, is trying to get the southern bell frog back into this area. The southern bell frogs are pretty much gone altogether from here now. And that, as you know, they're a big frog and uh, were probably uh, an important part of the diet of uh, tiger snakes and a lot of other animals as well. So you take them out, it's a big, big thing gone. Mm. What's, uh, what's destroying them? What, why are the southern bell frogs under threat? Well, uh, we can make a list of about 10 to 15 possible causes, don't really know. One of the, one of the ones high on the list would be uh, water level rise and fall. It's not happening when it suits the, the southern bell frog. There, in Victoria recently, there was a big influx of southern bell frogs at one of the wetlands there, and they just increased the level of the water there artificially, and it, it resulted in a, a big uh, population increase uh, of the southern bell frog. So it sounds like that is a very good reason for their decline. Mm. Or if you increase it uh, for the numbers to come back. We've done a few episodes with um, people that are 
involved with the River Murray talking about environmental flows and um, you know you can do this and it will suit this species but if you but it will harm this species and the reed gums need it to dry out and all these it's, it's so technical isn't it yeah yeah the the wetlands uh, that are reliant on uh, those flooding those wetlands doesn't happen as frequently now than it used to still happens but not as frequently so uh, one of the scientists involved with the southern bell frog here um, he's done a pretty thorough investigation of that subject and found that uh, this is probably one of the big reasons why we've lost the bell frog from this area it's the, the frequency of flooding of the, the wetlands and so tiger snakes used to be in and around woodside in the adelaide hills are they still yeah, around there we found a dead one on the road at Woodside, uh, would have been in the um, 90s. Uh, that's the only one I've heard of Gee. in recent times in Woodside. Not saying they're gone, but they're very low numbers now. Were, yeah. were bell frogs once in um, uh, that region on Capring? There probably were uh, species that were similar to bell frogs. Uh, bell frogs are going through a taxonomic change at the moment. Is a scientist at the museum is about to publish a paper on uh, Belfrock taxonomy, and uh, the ones that would have occurred in the Adelaide Hills in the southeast are going to be called something else. They're not not uh, the same as the Belfrocks along the River Murray. Okay, and yeah. they'll probably be, become critically endangered at that point once they yeah been... yeah they're they're in a similar situation because when when the uh, review was done of bell frogs uh, and they were put into the threatened category all around Australia, not just here. Uh, that included some of the ones that are going to be hived off onto, into different species okay. by this scientist at the museum. So they're currently Latoria raniformis. Yep. And they've got another common name, haven't they? Uh, Latara, Latoria raniformis is a scientific name. And what's the but other the, common the, name? The common name's a southern bell frog or a growling grasshopper. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, they've got a distinctive uh, call then. Oh, it's a beautiful call. Yeah. Uh, don't ask me to try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, it's actually, it yeah. uh, sounds a bit like a motorbike or a dog, dog growling. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if people are listening and they hear a crazy sounding frog, yeah. get out and record it. Absolutely, yeah. There's a frog watch... Uh, I think most people are aware of Frog Watch. It's a good thing to be involved with because it does help uh, scientists uh, gather information and say, OK, well, they're still there or they're there, in, but they're in low numbers or, or so on. And we'll just say we've done a couple of episodes with Steve Walker from yep. Landscapes. And oh, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a Frog Watch man. Isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a citizen science. Yeah, we had him <laughs> at our place. I've, the property I've got in the Matt Lofty Ranges we talked about earlier... Yep. Uh, before the show, it's got um, Bibron's toadlets. Yeah. And he came out and, and said, yep, that's what they are. And well, we, we thought they were too. But mm. um, but the interesting thing there is it's in an old quarry. So it's, I mean, the property's all remnant bushland, but there's an old uh, clay quarry on the property <laughs> yeah. that gets inundated with water for half the year and then it completely dries out. Mm. And that's why they are there because they dry, they lay their eggs in the dry mm. and then they sit in like a suspended animation until it inundates yep. and then they develop so if if that area was wet all the time or it didn't get that water there'd be none of these frogs and that's why they're so threatened in the mount lofty ranges yeah but it can be dry for a for a few years and they can still hatch when there's a wet Is season it? yeah is that, I'm not sure. I think so. I think that's what Steve said. That's yeah, I'm not sure either. Mm. Um, I think we've got the bibrons around here as well. They're only tiny, aren't they? Little dudes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we have them around here. Um, they've got a very high, squeaky call. It's a bit like a common frog. And it's funny because Stephen yeah. Walker, he will do the calls. if You, <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop him, so he's a busy party yeah. trick. Great guy. Um, <laughs> they're a poisonous frog too. Um, are they? Like, you know, the poison dart frogs, they're only poisonous if they eat an ant that's got the poison where they come this from. This is one from South America. The South American yeah. ones, whereas our pseudophrony group of frogs, like your corroboree frogs and the bibrons, they produce that poison. Apparently that's unusual. Okay, well, I wasn't aware of that, but there is another species of frog that has a poisonous compound in the skin in Australia. It's, uh, I think it's called the Toria Dali from the... 
desert areas. Um, one of the uh, death adder species has learnt to avoid them because of this uh, property it has. With it's like a gluey uh, compound, and uh, it, the, uh, the death adder has learnt to bite them and let go, and let them die, and then eat them because the venom degrades very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, the the secretion yeah. in the skin from the frog degrades very quickly. Isn't that clever? It's, it's, it, yeah. I find that stuff amazing because death adders don't teach their kids stuff. Like, you know, it's all it's It's, evolu- genetic, it's venom it? of evolu- yeah. evolution of the venom. And that would have taken thousands of years to happen. Gradually, there's little uh, variations of the venom. But even yeah. that behaviour, though, you know, yeah. like how do they... How do they, they, they did they learn that... Like genetically, the behaviour? It's amazing. It's like yeah. green tree pythons. When you breed green tree pythons and you hatch these eggs in an incubator away and they've never seen an adult one or anything and they hatch out and you put them into an enclosure with a perch and they perch like they're meant to perch. Yeah. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> 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 read it in a book. It's just, yeah. you know, well, it's it's just, just yeah. a, you know, one frog decides to do that and it survives longer or better. And so its genes are passed on, yeah, it's and uh, gradually uh, they become the dominant species. Mm. But that's how it happens, and usually takes quite a long time. Mm. Yeah. So, are you involved? You're, you're working with these frogs, aren't you? These southern bell frogs. Yeah. What's the project? Uh, one, me and I were looking around to do something for conservation when we retired, and uh, we wanted to do things that really would make a difference. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of money being given to organisations and sometimes nothing ever happens. And <laughs> So we th- said, OK, if we give this money to a project, we're going to have a bit of involvement in it as well. And uh, just, we were involved with a, a person, a female person uh, locally that we call her the frog lady because she's fairly knowledgeable about frogs. And um, she kept telling us about the southern bell frog and how threatened it was. And um, so I got interested in it. And um, then me and I decided we'd put our own money into uh, into this project. So we put quite a bit of money into it, set it up, <clears throat> and got scientists employed in it. And we set up the facility at the local plant nursery. And all this took a fair while to organise, as you can imagine. <laughs> You know, with the permits and convincing people that needed to be done and all, all the things. But anyway, it got done and it's now we now have um, 32 frogs in outside enclosures and we have an inside place to raise the tadpoles uh, all set up, ready to go. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and Fame are on board with this um, project too, Yeah. Uh, what Mia and I didn't want to do was to administer the money. We wanted to put the money in, but we didn't want to be involved in administering it because we've been involved in that with our business with uh, Venom Production for a long time. We're retired now. We just want to stick it in. We'll be involved, but we don't want to administer the money. So we all looked around and Fame agreed to do that. Uh, and we put through their board and they approved it and um, they administer the money. I love FAME. If you want to throw money at a conservation project, FAME have ecologists that oversee any potential pro- projects, don't they? And yeah. they yeah. They, um, they look at it pretty um, thoroughly. And um, They you know, put a really good business mind to it as well, I they think. Do. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, we need people uh, to do that. We need people with a good business mind yeah. to, to run the projects and... and, and look for milestones in achievement before they pay out. So that's very important, I think. So we wanted someone to do that. Yeah, you've kind of of got got to hit targets to get any more money from other things, and that's just awesome. That's Mm. how you get things done properly. See, governments don't always do that. Mm. They they give the money out and never even revisit it, Mm. uh, which is a pity, really. I I think they spend something like $9 billion a year on on the environment in Australia and we're still losing species. You know, to me, I would say we're not going to put any more money until you start winning, mm. winning the battle. Mm. And yeah. then, then we'll see them concentrate on things that really matter 
at the moment, I don't think so. I mean, it, it probably brings me on to another subject that that I'm very interested in, and that's dingoes. Um, why would you get interested in dingoes if you really cut your teeth on snakes and snake venom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some, but they are so important for snakes, and they're so important for a lot of other species. They don't actually have any direct impact on snakes, but they have a very big impact on the environment that they live in. And they're an apex predator in Australia. And without the apex predator, the environment just collapses. And that's what it has south of the dingo fence. That's basically what's happened. Um, North of the dingo fence, we've still got them, but they still bait them. Poison dingoes, I mean, it's terrible. Um, And uh, the whole environment is suffering because of it. If you drive up the Sturt Highway and have a look at the, the habitat either side where they're grazing cattle, uh, it's just a mess in a lot of places. It's utterly destroyed. Some of them are doing well, but some aren't. And one of the reasons for that, not all, not the only reason, but one of the reasons for that is they don't have dingoes. Or they have dingoes and they upset their social structure by poisoning them. Yeah, we had John Reid on the show yeah, and he was talking about once you go north of the dog, the dog fence, you start finding things like morgaras and and perdas yeah. and other you know threatened kind of yep. marsupials that are in that critical yep. weight range that you don't get south of. And the that's fence. despite of the uh, bait, baiting that goes on. You imagine what you'd have if you didn't bait. And those species that John was talking about, those small mammals, are very important. They're what I call the little uh, environmental engineers. They eat plants, they eat seeds, they take seeds away and store them in places and they might die and the seeds stay there and grow. And a lot of the grass species and plant species that we uh, have regeneration of only regenerates because of that. And if you take out those animals, which happens when you've got foxes and cats everywhere, mm. uh, we, you know, they wipe out all these animals. And dingoes play a big role in controlling foxes and cats. So... Whilst they will prey on some of those small mammals, uh, overall they're better for those small mammals than uh, if we don't have dingoes. So that's why I'm passionate about uh, spreading the word. I'm probably what you call a dingo advocate. I'm not involved in any scientific work with them, but i am certainly read all the scientific papers and got involved. I'm trying to convince the government to get them back into the environment and trying to get landowners and cattle producers. They're very important for cattle producers because if you, you produce cattle, uh, they actually benefit. Uh, it's been worked out by uh, some scientific studies that if you own a property with uh, dingoes on them and you're producing cattle, they'll benefit you by about $84,000 for every hundred every 1,000 acres, uh, thousand hectares you've got. So they're, they're highly beneficial. And some cattle producers will say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And maybe I don't. But what they don't realise is if you're baiting them, if you're baiting dingoes, it totally upsets their social structure. And they don't behave normally and they will prey on calves. If you stop the baiting, let them re-establish that social structure you'll get a more functional dingo population back again and then they'll start benefiting you. So what would they be eating if they weren't eating calves, if they were more, if their structure was more um, intact? There's a cattle producer uh, in Western Australia on Woolleen Station called Dave Pollock and he believes that Dingoes are a vital part of his overall strategy of producing cattle. Um, he, uh, if he doesn't have dingoes, he'll have far too many kangaroos and he'll have goats as well. The dingoes wipe out the goats totally uh, and they control the, dingo, control the kangaroos down to about 5-10% of uh, what they are if you don't have the dingoes. And they can, that, that grazing pressure competes with the cattle so it's better not to have that if you're a cattle producer that's interesting isn't it that makes complete but as sense, well as that, yeah. as well as that they uh, also dingoes contribute to the spread of different plant species as well and 
there was a, a paper came out only a couple of weeks ago showing, you know, mentioned that dingo fence before. Uh, if, if you look at uh, satellite imagery of the north side of the dingo fence and south side, you can see the vegetation is in far better shape on the place where there are dingoes and compared with where they're not. Wow. Yeah. Well, because there's nothing down here controlling herbivores like no, the size of a no, kangaroo, is there? No, the, ding- the kangaroos are in plague proportions on this area, I mean, unless you shoot them, which you, is not a good idea because you're taking out the wrong um, animals. It's better to let it happen naturally where, you, where you've got an apex predator. But, you know, they've got to put up with um, parasites and all those things and diseases like most other animals, uh, but of course humans hunting them and shooting them and baiting them and trapping them. If we didn't do that, if we left them alone, uh, we'd be far better off. I'm not saying this for sheep in the sheep country. we still got a way to go before we can work out how to have dingoes in sheep country uh, because dingoes prey on sheep. There's no question about that and affect uh, sheep production quite dramatically. But what I'm advocating is you can straight away do something about dingoes in the cattle country. And it'll, it'll affect all species. It won't just affect uh, the dingoes. It won't. It'll affect all the mammals. It'll affect all the birds. The because plants. Of all the plants, especially the plants. And that's been shown time and time again. There's been studies done on plant species in relation to dingoes. There's been studies done on satellite imagery, looking at where dingoes are, where they're not. There's been studies done on the number of mammal species, where there are dingoes and where they're not. It all points to this, the same thing, that dingoes are just vital for the, um, for the environment. Is it possible then to, to let the dingoes in but keep them away from the sheep farming areas? Is that actually possible? Or? Uh, no, not really at the moment. Um, you, there's a lot of people using marimba dogs or, or other sort of guardian dogs, and they seem to be where people are using them properly. They seem to be wonderful. They'll keep keep predators away, but uh, doing it on a, a broad scale because some people would do it well and some people wouldn't. So the ones that wouldn't would be losing sheep hand over fist. So that'd be bad for the publicity of dingoes. Mm. Um, so <clears throat> I think we've got a way to go with sheep. But at the moment with cattle, it's a no-brainer, really. I mean, we should be doing it straight away. And there are, there are many cattle producers now using dingoes for that. There's a guy called Angus Emmett in Queensland. He, he has a cattle station and he believes strongly that you need dingoes there to benefit your cattle production. And there are others as well. So, Angus, that's a good name for a, for a cattle, pro- cattle producer. producer. <laughs> yeah. Angus Emmett. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, I want to mention your book here. It's called mm-hmm. Australia's Dangerous Snakes, Identification, Biology and Envenoming. I have this book. It's a fantastic book, and thank you for signing it for me. Um, did you want to say a few words about it? Oh, OK. Uh, it's, a, it's a project that we took on uh, quite a long time ago. It took me about <clears throat> 12 years to, to produce it. Um, I think if you read it, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff in there. It's basically basically a collection of all my experience with uh, dangerous snakes and also it's got all the latest scientific information in it about venoms and about snakes of each of the species we cover in it. So it covers um, quite a lot about venoms because uh, venoms is what I was involved in, so I know a little bit about them. So we we put in, uh, it has a fairly big emphasis on venoms and there is a chapter just on venoms in the book. Uh, It has uh, about each species of snake. It's got a complete description of the species and uh, and, uh, their conservation status. And it's got a chapter on conservation itself in, in general about how and what are the big impacts on snakes and some of the things we can do to... Uh, to improve their their lot. Uh, It also has a historical chapter in there about venom collection, which uh, tracks all the old snake people from years and years ago and how they 
bravely uh, collected venom when there wasn't any antidotes if they made a mistake. And um, it has a, a big medical chapter in it as well. So it can be used as a textbook by doctors to treat snake bite. And if somebody wants to buy this book, what's the best uh, way they can do that? Uh, if anyone wants to buy the book, uh, there are most of the big uh, booksellers on the internet uh, have it listed, uh, even on eBay, you get it on eBay, um, Amazon, the big booksellers. Uh, you can go on to a site called booko.com and you can pick, compare the prices from one place to another and uh, pick uh, the, the most the best offer that they make or you can go to CSIRO's uh, website and buy it from there um, or it may be available in some bookshops as well or you can order it through a bookshop if you want to we might put a link on the on the website definitely will yep. yeah well, um, we'll read it first make well, sure yeah. it's all correct <laughs> I mean I can say the pictures look great the pictures are great yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it has actually been reviewed by a lot of people and uh, I think the re- all the reviews are on the CSIRO web- website and uh, most of the reviewers have been uh, highly professional people who are in one field or another associated with what we covered in the book. And all of them have been good, surprisingly. Yeah, yeah I've only just got my copy, yeah. but my friends that have it, they, they speak highly of it. Yeah. Absolutely. You said... Um, you talk about the conservation status of some of the snakes and things that we can do to help them out. Yeah. What are some of the things we can do? Uh, one of the... Oh, there's so many things. Uh, if you're thinking of sea snakes, uh, probably the things that are affecting them are the most are global warming. Um, it hasn't actually been stated concisely or succinctly as global warming, but uh, from my reading of it all, global warming seems to have a fairly big... Um, role in uh, the decline of some of the sea snakes, especially on some of the reefs off offshore. Um, but there are so many things that affect uh, uh, dangerous snakes, I probably can't go through them all, but uh, of the terrestrial snakes, I think the things that affect, affect uh, snakes the most are foxes and cats, the impact of foxes and cats. Now, they don't tend to prey on snakes that much directly. That's not the problem. They actually just compete with them for food, and that's where the big problem is. Sna- uh, fox and cats take out a huge number of uh, native animals every year, and a lot of those are the, what the snakes eat. So uh, they have a big impact on uh, dangerous snakes and many other native species as well. I'm guessing cane toads have had a bit of a impact too. Yep, cane toads are one of the things we cover in the book. Um, the direct impact is, is unknown. There's not been no figures done, but they pretty much affect most native species. And um, there are actually a couple of uh, snake species, not dangerous ones, that, that can prey on cane toads without any effect. One's the uh, keelback snake. It's a harmless snake. It seems to be able to eat them. Only small ones, of course, but it seems to be able to eat them without any trouble at all. Um, just while you're on cane toads, there is a really good book on cane toads uh, written by Rick Shine from Sydney University. Uh, if anyone wants to read that, it's a fascinating book. I uh, really enjoyed reading it and it covers some of the things they're doing to try and reduce the impact of cane toads on our native fauna. Hmm. There we go. Um, here's a quick, I've always wanted to know, like, I've got a lot of friends who are snake catchers and it's their job to come and take a snake away from a school or a house or somewhere where it's dangerous and they have to release it kind of almost just around the corner where it's always probably going to come back. Um, but then sometimes they're translocated even further out. There are studies that show that that's not always the best idea for the snake, aren't there? Yeah, that's, that's true. There's a lot of studies done overseas and I think we've had three or four in Australia as well that um, pretty much all say something similar that it's not a good idea to shift a snake from A to B because it has a spatial understanding of its place where it lives and when you shift it, what it tends to do is to move around all the time trying to find its way around, using up a whole lot of energy 
uh, for no real value at all to the snake. So uh, in a lot of instances where there have been studies done, uh, shown that sometimes these are fatal to the snakes. In the end, it just doesn't adapt to its new... It's a bit like me taking you, taking your credit card off you, putting a blindfold on you and taking you to another country and saying you survive there. That's, that's what it's like translocating a snake to another place. Um, <clears throat> trend, you know, the snake catchers do a good job. I don't really get the wrong idea. They certainly have reduced the number of snake bites to the, the public, and that's a good thing. But I think it's now time to take the next step and transform snake catchers into snake educators where they start educating people to leave the snakes where they are in most cases. It's quite okay to do that. Not all cases, but in a lot of cases it's okay to do that. Snakes live around us anyway. Uh, We should try and learn to live with them rather than have them removed all the time, which is detrimental to them. It's probably even not even safe to do it because when you um, take a snake away, what happens is eventually another snake moves in and that snake might not know you as well as the one that was there that was taken away. And the one that was there originally, whilst it wasn't a friend with you, uh, it was aware you were around and and probably wouldn't react as uh, aggressively as as a new one that doesn't know you. If you uh, took the one away and a new one came in, uh, it wouldn't know you as well. So not as safe to get close to those as the one that knows you. That's interesting. Yes, yeah, familiar with you, so you, it sort of knows what you're doing. Yeah. And, and they're just trying to stay away, aren't they? They're only trying to do what they do. They're only trying to catch food and um, find a good place, safe place to live. They're not really wanting to do anything bad to us humans. Not at all. It's not in their interest to do that. Yeah, and I think that extends to our cats and our dogs too. Oh, you have to explain that one to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I always hear people say, oh, bloody you know, snakes, this and that, one bit my cat. And I was like, well, I don't think it went out looking for your cat. I think your cat went ah. up to the snake and the snake just didn't want to get killed. Yep. We did a, a veterinary survey back in the 90s um, and we found that uh, cats and dogs are the most common uh, pet animal that get bitten, domestic animal that get bitten. Um, and in all the cases, uh, cats seek out snakes and dogs seek it. It's in there. It's, it's wired into them. That's what they do, yeah? That's not the cat's fault, not the dog's fault. They just do that. But, of course, if they, get, if they catch a snake, quite often they're bitten. And um, then they've got to be treated. It costs a lot of money to get a, a dog or a cat treated for a snake bite. I am impressed, though, <laughs> that a dog kills a snake with its face and and you know quite often most of the time they don't get bitten you know everyone's got stories of like my dog killed a red belly on my property and you think it's a pretty good effort <laughs> just yeah. imagine trying to kill a snake with my face yeah they don't get bitten on the face that much because they never always grab a grab a snake at the head area they grab it in the midsection or somewhere along the snake and the snake just turns around and bites them I reckon it, it, like, with a venomous snake would only get, like, especially a dog or a cat, it would have to hit them in s- specific places to be able to envenomate them because the fangs are not that big to go through the fur. So through unless fur. it got on the nose, on a lip, something like that, or on a belly. Yeah, yeah, okay. like, but if it swung around and got it on the shoulder or something, it probably wouldn't envenomate it anyway, would it? Uh, I think in most cases they don't get bitten around the head area. They do sometimes, but not... Most cases, they get bitten in uh, anywhere on the, on the animal, and fur would be a deterrent uh, for some snake species, especially browns, mm. uh, where they've got very small fangs. Uh, but tiger snakes have got longer fangs, and then taipans have got huge fangs, so uh, they wouldn't have any trouble. Uh, but even with the brown snakes with small fangs, uh, they're the ones that cause most bites. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's because there's lots around, isn't it? Probably, probably to do with the numbers, yeah. They have seemed to have adapted well to human-modified habitat. Uh, they've done much better than tigers and death adders and all the rest of them. So uh, with more brown snakes around, uh, 
sooner or later they're going to they're going to be successful biting something. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about today? Um, I think uh, what people can do if they really want to do some good things for conservation, it's best to look at the things that will have major impacts. Uh, just saving one specimen here or one specimen there is good, but uh, it's not going to make any major difference to the total environment. So we talked about dingoes before. Dingoes, if you, if you just get out and promote the need to have dingoes as apex predators in the environment, that's a good thing because dingoes are crucial to save many of our native species, including dangerous snakes. But there is another thing. Uh, if you drive around the place, uh, you'll see a lot of farmland that is pretty bare, of, especially uh, this time of year or through the drier months a uh, year when there's nothing growing or even after they start to plough up the ground. All of that area is not growing anything. It's, it's producing no effect on uh, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's good if we can have a farming method that actually does always take carbon dioxide or other uh, global warming gases out of the atmosphere. And there is a method that's growing by, just as we speak, uh, called regenerative agriculture. Um, it's, it's a wonderful new method. It's creating more biodiversity. It's, um, it's also improving the income on farms without using a whole lot of chemicals, without using a lot of fertilisers, without using herbicides, without using pesticides. And these tonnes and tonnes of that stuff are being put out uh, using traditional methods of agriculture. And this doesn't disappear, it stays there. It gets into our food and affects our health and um, it costs the farmer a lot of money to put it out. With regenerative agriculture you don't need to do that you don't put it out and it's been shown time and time again farmers doing this they don't they don't they make more money they're they're producing greater yields uh making more money and they're rehab they're putting more habitat back in to where they live and uh, this is great for our native species including our dangerous snakes so they're the sorts of things people can do they can promote this sort of thing. And one way to promote it is buy the produce that these places produce. And that will uh, even stimulate it even further. But also talk to people, encourage people to, to uh, support this sort of uh, agriculture and also support the dingoes, of course. Fantastic. So it's a question to ask if you're buying stuff, is do you do regenerative agriculture? If they say yes, buy it. Yeah, I mean, where, where you buy food is one place. Uh, you, you have a choice. You can buy you, you can buy uh, produce that's produced by traditional methods, and you won't be getting anywhere near the quality of food that you get where where it's produced by regenerative agriculture. The food that's produced by regenerative agriculture tastes a hell of a lot better. And it's far better for you because it doesn't have all the chemical uh, the chemicals involved in the, in the produce itself. Mm. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, I can speak to. Them. I've got a veggie patch at home, and uh, I don't buy anything from the shops to do with you know veggies because I have to grow it all myself. Um, and it's great. I don't use any pesticides. No, and if you grow tomatoes. Uh, aren't tomatoes you grow yourself a lot better than the ones you buy yeah i was surprised that tomatoes actually taste good if you yeah you know They're really sweet aren't they? yeah you get a vine ripened one <laughs> and it's like actually yeah. nice yeah. yeah so that's the sort of thing with with regenerative agriculture you'll find the food tastes a hell of a lot better uh, it's far better for you and far better for the environment and it doesn't just start above the soil it starts in the soil as well all the chemicals that are being put out now uh, go into the soils and they're killing all the microflora in the soils and uh, some of these are just vital for the health of uh, plants that grow in them and also the biodiversity. So regenerative agriculture is something that everyone should be promoting. What's that doc at your place, Steve? And, 2040. Uh, is that what it's called? I think so, yeah. Yeah, the guy got into it because he was 
digging in his in his farm, and he's like, "There's no worms here." He'd never thought about it before. And he's like, "There's no worms. Why isn't there worms?" And it just set him off on this journey, didn't it? Yeah, I think that was twenty four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. does have a few other names: regenerative agriculture. Uh, one of the other ones is permaculture. Uh, it probably has a number of other ones, but I can't just think of at the moment. But uh, it's any method that doesn't use a lot of chemicals and in the form of pesticides and herbicides and and uh, fertiliser. Uh, but also you don't plough the ground up as much or even not at all. Uh, you use grazing that's... Uh, you move the animals on very quickly. You don't leave them in one place for a long period of time. There's a whole lot of things that you can do but it's far better for the environment. And uh, those farmers that are doing it have plants growing all the year round rather than just uh, at certain times of the year when their crops ripen. So it's important to support because it, I think there's a bit of a financial outlay initially for those guys. Um, not, not a lot. Not so no, much? Well, okay. it depends what you do. But, yeah. yeah, in a lot of cases there isn't. It's a, it's a cost-benefit straight away. Yeah. There you go. Very Good advice, mate. Look, that was such a great chat. I love how you, you covered all bases, but ultimately it's all about conservation. Yeah. Fantastic. It is. And uh, what people have got to realise is humans are only another species on the planet and uh, we've got to learn to live with nature, not against it. That's very important. Because we are it, aren't we? Yeah. We're yeah. definitely the future of it. Well, we're not the future of it because it will carry on without us, but we need to try and do better with what we're doing now. Can I ask you one more thing, Peter? It's something that I've always wanted to know. You milk snakes, or your, your venom supplies milks the snake. Can you use that milk in tea? No. <laughs> Bloody <Can English>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, there what? is a... Some of the Asian countries use venom in... No, I'm not surprised. Yeah. In uh, soups and <laughs> yeah. things, so... But it probably from, wouldn't hurt you. From that point of milking a venomous snake, yeah. how do we actually get anti-venom? Uh, okay, so uh, the first stage is you got to milk the venom from the snake by various methods. Uh, you know, I uh, won't go into all those because uh, they're covered in the book if you want to look at that. Um, but uh, you get the venom from the snake, you freeze dry it and store it, and when you're ready to use it, this is for anti-venom production, uh, you send it to the anti-venom manufacturers, which in Australia is um, Sequeris, uh, who used to, uh, it's an offshoot from CSL. Um, they uh, inject the venom, they reconstitute it into a liquid and inject it into horses. I think they've even um, even subcontracted that out now. There's a place in Queensland to do it. So that gets injected into the horses and the horses, in small amounts of course, are none sufficient to induce uh, an antibody reaction from the horse. The horse makes the antibodies. You keep topping it up and gradually increasing it over a period of time. And uh, then, uh, say about 12 months' time, you've got a, a teeter fairly high. Then you harvest blood from the horse. And that goes through a number of processes, that blood. Uh, you get rid of all the red cells and white cells and you're left with just the serum and in that serum are the antibodies and we add a preservative to it and that's pretty essentially the uh, anti-venom. That's a lot of processes. That's a long time, like a year yeah. before it gets to that point. There's not a lot why. Of, yeah, not a lot of money to be made with anti-venom. Because <laughs> it's super expensive. It's a very expensive it, to make yeah. and uh, it is expensive to buy but it wouldn't anywhere near recoup the costs of... Uh, manufacturers, they have to subsidise it. The government has yeah, to well. subsidise it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, uh, when you everyone's familiar with the process that uh, the coronavirus vaccines went through. Well, it's same for antivenoms. They've got to go through the same mm. same approval process as the um, uh, virus vaccines. Yeah. Very interesting. Mate, thank you so much for having us. That was great. That's awesome. Um, and guys, thank you for listening. <laughs>